my suffering. And that's what people usually ask. Why me? Does God not love me? What's happening? Now, let's get one thing clear. And I quote here from the late uh, Bishop Johannes of Arbeia. I like this very much. He said, since man lived on this planet, he has endured suffering. So I'm going to be giving you some truth, some points that if you're writing anything down, write these ones that I say are moments of truth or points to remember. This is the first one. Since man lived on this planet, Sayyidina here is referring to the time, obviously, after sin entered and, and, and uh, suffering entered through sin. He has endured suffering. And this is what the Apostle St. Paul said, the whole creation groans and labors with pangs together. So not only are humans suffering, but the whole creation is suffering. So there is no exception when it comes to suffering. That's one of the other points that I'd like you to remember. No exception. You will suffer, I will suffer, every single person will suffer in this world. So these people are standing up and one says, I suffer, what do you do? You know, I, it has to come to our um, recognition and understanding that we are going to suffer. You know why that's important, guys? Because if we don't prepare ourselves to that moment, we won't be ready when it comes. You prepare for suffering when you are not as suffering as you will be. This is the right time to do this. So, how do we define suffering? Can anyone here define suffering for me? What is suffering to you? I can start. Um, sometimes I think suffering is when my plasma TV is not working very well when I'm watching the, the ball game. Yes? Right. So something about not in your control, something bad, and? And it just makes you feel like helpless, but you can't do anything. And you feel helpless, you can't do anything. Any other definitions? Yes, Paul? Uh, the acceptance of, of something happening. The, the, struggle comes from. the struggle comes from actually accepting the suffering. So I define it as it's quite an emotional, emotionally charged word that no one really wants to hear or say, I am suffering. It could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual, it could be psychological. But I like this one. I like this definition. One of the youth gave me this definition. He says, Abuna, I think suffering is anything which we don't get that we desperately want or anything we get which we desperately don't want. And so I thought, come on, then suffering must be very subjective because what you desperately don't want could be something that I desperately want. When you go to the extremes of suffering, then you get absolutes. But you get, uh, I don't know about you down here in the States, but in Canada, uh, Tim Hortons is a, is a big thing. People say, I'm suffering because I didn't drink my coffee this morning. But that's not the type of suffering we're talking about. I use the term desperately to distinguish this definition from trivial things such as the kind of coffee that you will have or the dessert that you will have. So some suffering makes sense. What suffering makes sense to you? Is there sufferings that make sense to you? Yes. Physical pains. Why does it make sense to you? If you could elaborate, just give me an idea. What, what makes them? Because there are physical feelings. Okay, but does it make sense to you why you have the physical pain? What's that? You hit yourself on something, it'll hurt. Yeah, if you put your 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 fist, you know, and, and your, your palm under your your legs, it will hurt. It makes sense. I mean, you did something to yourself. I mean, there are sufferings that make sense, like this one, for example. Here. A terrorist uses a suicide bomb, he dies. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, a drunk driver gets into an accident, he gets seriously injured. Dare any of these people say, why suffering, right? 
And then a third one, someone smokes six packs of cigarettes a day, they get lung cancer. Makes sense. We like these things because they make sense. We can stand them with you deserve it. We like that. We like to put everything in compartments and boxes and this one falls into the you deserve it box. But hold on, there is, this is not a complete picture. We're forgetting something here. These people are not suffering alone. Look at this. A terrorist uses suicide bomb, he dies, I can understand that. But 15 other innocent people die. Why? What did they do? A drunk driver gets into an accident, he gets seriously injured. But the young driver whom he collided into also died. Why? Someone smokes six packs of cigarettes a day, they get lung cancer, fine. But their two-year-old child gets leukemia from secondhand smoking. Why? Now we start getting into, that is unfair. So who is to blame for all the suffering in the world? As humans, our natural tendency is to try to find the cause of suffering. Have you ever heard that the why question is usually not a good question to ask? Now we learn, we know this since we're very young. When our younger sibling, everything that mom says, he or she would say what? Why? And then you give them an answer that you think is reasonable. Then they ask again, why? And then you give them another answer that makes sense. And then they ask the question, why? And then you know what, what happens after that. People usually don't hold their patience. But you, nevertheless, we ask this question all the time. We want to put the blame. We want to find out why. Who is to blame for the situation we're in? Is it God, the devil, other humans? Dare I say it, is it I? Did I do something wrong? Well, let's look at physical disease. Being born with a debilita debilitating disease like cancer, viral infection, H1N1, swine flu, meningitis. What did these people do to deserve these devastating diseases? Some people will say nothing. How about mental anguish? Some people are perfectly physically healthy, but they have a mental uh, distress. Some have schizophrenia, eating disorders, you name it, addictions. These types of diseases states are often even more debilitating than physical disorders. People suffer. Now, what is the theological view of suffering? You know why we have such a hard time helping people through their suffering. You know why we have such a hard time reconciling with our own suffering? I'm going to suggest to you because we don't have the right theology of suffering. We don't have the biblical view of suffering. We don't know what it means to suffer and why we suffer from God's point of view, from the biblical point of view. We form our own philosophy from the culture we grow in, or from the friends and their opinions, or what we think. Go back to the Bible. We have to have the right theology of suffering. And you know what? This is not just our problem. This was a problem that Jesus himself encountered with some of the people, with his own disciples. Can someone recall when was the question of why suffering came up and the Lord gave an answer to his disciples? Yes? Lazarus, they never, they didn't ask why, they said if he's asleep, he'll get up, but there was a point where, where the disciples asked the Lord, the blind man, who sinned? Now we want to find out the reason for his suffering, who sinned? Did he sin or his parents? But Jesus gave them a completely different answer. So the heart of the problem really is God's nature. Understanding suffering will never be complete unless you understand God and understand who God is and what he says about suffering. So looking at this, say God is omnipotent, meaning that he can do anything. He's omniscient, he knows everything. He's omnipresent, means he's everywhere. God is good, he's infinitely loving. 
But then the problem is, if God is absolutely good, infinitely loving, I'm sure some of you know where this is going, and all-powerful, He can do anything, why do we suffer? He loves us, and He can do anything. Why then does He suffer? So the world gives an answer to this, and the world says, well, we have one of three answers. Either God does not exist, or they have a twisted answer, God is good but he's not all-powerful. He's good, but he cannot really overcome evil. He can not really, um, you know, kick the diseases out of this world. He has good intentions. He wants to prevent our suffering, but he cannot. Or the world will say God is omnipotent, but he's not good. He could stop suffering, but he doesn't want to. He is not all that loving. But we're saying, the Bible says that God, is, that God is good, that He's all-loving, God is good, God is, all, God is love, 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So the Bible says God is love. It's very clear. God is all-powerful. Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Therefore, he is able to prevent suffering and he finds no pleasure in suffering. That's another thing you need to write down. God does not delight in suffering. He allows it, but he does not delight in suffering. And he's able to prevent suffering he has the power to do so suffering is real it touches us or those we love so how can we explain human suffering in a universe created by a good loving omnipotent god what does the bible say about suffering and this is kind of the meat of the talk today this, is this next part what does the Bible say? What are the reasons for suffering? Well, what do we know? First, we know that God permits suffering because suffering is all around. And nothing happens unless God allows it to happen. That God is not overcome by sin, so sin is not hard for God to overcome it. In fact, as you know, God has destroyed death by dying on the cross. He has transformed death into a way for us to live eternally. But this is what I want you to realize. We live in a very abnormal way, in a very abnormal world. You guys tell me, how, how is this world normal when the person you thought is your friend backstabs you? Huh? How? How is this world normal when Parents or family members abuse children of their, own mem of their own family. How is this world normal? You tell me, how is this world normal when those who are supposed to be together for life, 50% of them end up not together for life? We live in an abnormal world. God who created a normal world, allowing us the freedom to choose, we have so freely introduced this abnormality into this world. Suffering is not always due to personal sin. So yes, sin made the world abnormal, but not every suffering is due to personal sin. And what we also know is that Christians and non-Christians both suffer. So, what? The Bible urges us to do what we can to relieve suffering. We'll talk about this when, um, when we come to uh, discuss receiving those who are suffering. Just want to outline here that we are... Tr we, the Bible says you cannot be passive when it comes to suffering. If you see someone suffering and you're embarrassed to help, you know, I, we've been there, and you don't know what to do, and you'd rather just, you know, hide somewhere and not show your face. No. 
The Bible says you've got to help. It says we are to visit orphans and widows, to be generous and ready to share, and we, and we have a social responsibility toward, towards those who are suffering. And I'll be talking about this later on. Keep in mind, whatever happens in, happen in our lives, God has our eternal good in view. He does have a good purpose in view for us. So even the worst of the, of the worst that could happen to us, God can change. And I quote here Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for good to those who love him. What do you think the key word is here? All. Not some things God will make them work for the good. All things will work for the good. I want to suggest to you that we don't, we don't know how to lament biblically. We don't know how to accept suffering biblically. Once we do, then things will be different. Philosophy of suffering, why do people suffer? And the counselors of Job, Job's friend, in, in trying to give him some answers, he's asking, what's happening to me? Why am I suffering? And all these friends came to really give, give him this lecture. Job, you're suffering because. And some of their advices were wrong. Who sinned? This man or his parents? That was a question on why suffering. Why is this man suffering? Is it personal sin or parental sin? But a third option was given by Jesus Christ. This I'd like you to remember. If you can have this theology of suffering, understand why suffering happens. Those are my eight points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points. Eight sources of suffering. You can add to them, but those are the main ones. And I put them in very simple terms. I sinned, they sinned. Uh, you're going to memorize them with me today. I sinned, I sinned. they sinned. Yes. Evil. Evil. Okay. And then I did something right. I did something. They did something right. So you can repeat after me. I sinned, they sinned. Evil. I did something right, they did something right. God wants me to grow. Glory of God or the greater good. Or to comfort others. Let me go through some of these. I sinned. So suffering could come into your life or mine because we individually sinned. We've done something wrong. Diseases are a common source of suffering. People often blame God for their disease, but we, have, we often have a huge role to play in some cases. Definitely not all, but in some. So someone who drinks and ends up with liver disease. Why am I suffering with liver cancer? Why am I suffering with liver disease? Well, because you drank too much. Um, smoking, drug abuse, you get the idea. Biblically, look at Adam and Eve. Why, why, is Adam, why was Adam suffering? Why did Eve suffer giving birth? Because of their sin, for their own wrongdoing. David and Bathsheba. David was doing well up until he did what? He sinned and he lost his, his child and he suffered greatly. Why? David would cry out and say, why am I suffering? And you will answer and say, it's the I sinned, because you, there is this I sin. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be fooled. You cannot cheat God. People harvest only what they plant. So if you plant sin, you will reap suffering. And Ecclesiastes, most of a person's problems are of their own, of, or own devising. So I sinned, the second source is, they sinned. They sinned, let's face it, oftentimes one human is the cause of another's suffering. Any example from, from you guys? Where you've suffered because of someone else's wrongdoing? Gossiping. Although that's questionable. <laughs> um, hmm? Yes? 
a drunk driver. The, the papers are full of it. Statistics on murders, rapes, muggings. We all know who the culprits are and it is not God. Someone says, says said to me once, my friend died in, an, in a car accident and I cannot come to worship anymore. Cannot come to the church anymore. I said, why? Why does God allow something like this to happen? I said, how did he die? He said, well, he had a few drinks before leaving the party and he got into a car accident and died. And I said, and why are you blaming God in this? It's, you know, the, whoever was driving, it's fault. Drunk driver. They sent, when you look at the Bible, Joseph is a good example. Because he suffered because of whose wrongdoings? His brothers. He even said that to his brothers. You intended evil for me. God changes things. Who else suffered because of someone else in the Bible? Jesus. Judas betrays him and he gets, all, he gets the suffering and gets, gets to be arrested. Saul and David. David suffers because of Saul. You said Judas. I like this verse in Galatians chapter 5. It says, the wrong things the sinful self does are clear, being sexually unfaithful, not being pure, taking part in sexual sins, worshiping gods, doing witchcraft, hating, making trouble, being jealous, being angry, causing divisions among people. All these are things that if people do, others will suffer. If you go on hurting each other, says St. Paul, you will completely destroy each other. The third cause of suffering, evil. Why do people suffer? Either they sinned or other people sinned against them or just sinned or because of the evil system. I mean, we all love the martyrs and we all, you know, um, venerate the, you know, the, the martyrs and, and the relics, but did they suffer or not? And they suffered because there was an evil system at the time of Diocletian, for example, the paganism, uh, also, Job was suffering because of the devil's accusations. So the devil comes, walks up to, uh, to present himself before God and says, I have an accusation against Job. He says, I want to tempt him. So he suffers. Job suffers because of the evil one. In Ephesians, we're told about the suffering coming from the world, the flesh, or the devil. And in Luke chapter 13, this woman that I healed, says the Lord, a daughter of Abraham, has been held by Satan for 18 years. He is a direct indication that this woman's suffering, she was held by the devil in her sickness. I did something right. This is number four. Can you suffer because you do something right? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Joseph says, well, I'm not doing this wrong thing. I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to flee. What happens to Joseph? He gets thrown into, into jail. St. Stephen's ministry, he preaches one of the very nice sermons. And he suffers for it. He gets stoned. St. Peter says, but if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you. And in Matthew, says, persecuted for the sake of righteousness. So yes, you could do something right and for it you'll be suffered. Or others could do something right. Can you quote a story from the Bible where when someone did something right, others suffered? How about Moses? What did he do right? He went to Pharaoh and he said what? Let my people go. What does Pharaoh do? He increases the labor of the Jews. So when others do something right, also one can suffer. And if the world hates you, you know it hated me before you. You are not of the world. That's why many people will do the right thing and for it. Either they will suffer or others will suffer. So if you're living a distinctively Christian life, you will suffer for doing something right. Or God wants me to grow. And that becomes a source or the reason behind the suffering. He wants my faith to mature. He wants to free me from sin. He wants to free me from myself or he wants to bring forth fruits in my life. 
Um, look at bringing fruits. The Lord says he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You know, if there is, there is a tree that brings forth fruit, what does the Lord do to it? He prunes it. And in pruning it, part of that is suffering to bring more fruit. Job. It is said that Job was good and all, but he had a little bit of self-righteousness. He actually said, I am blameless. And maybe for that, he also, the Lord wanted him to grow. God's glory or greater goodness, another reason for suffering, the born blind. The Lord said, neither has he sinned nor his parents, but that the glory of God may be manifest. The three young men in the fiery furnace, when they came out of the fiery furnace, the king said what? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he gave the glory to God because of the suffering of these three people. Or the greater good, what I call the Caiaphas mentality. You know the Caiaphas mentality, what Caiaphas said? He says what? It is better for one man that one man should die than for the whole people to perish. So sometimes there is suffering that happens where let's say a father receives a suffering instead of his kids um, and that's for, for greater goodness. Um, the story told about Tamav Irini, um, I read it in one of her books, where she said to the Lord, I know that suffering and temptation and hardship must come. But I don't want the pain or the suffering to come in the form of problems between the nuns. So give it to me. So it said in one of her books that she said, if suffering is to come, then I'd rather take it in me, in my health, than to see it amongst the nuns. And in that, she received suffering for the greater good. And finally, comfort others. St. Paul says, you know, sometimes you suffer so that you can comfort others. Um, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Um, I share with you a story that just happened also last summer in our church. Um, about a year before that, one of our youth got diagnosed with leukemia. And I remember the face of his mother. She was so devastated. She could not believe that her son um, has cancer. And she would come and cry to me and then go to another priest and we would all be together there. And, and she could not, she did not know, she didn't know, know what to do. Until a month after that, she got diagnosed with cancer. And she was the greatest support to her young boy, to this youth. And she passed away just last summer, and he's still alive. And he says, you know, I was able to go through this because my mom, who first panicked, when she started suffering herself, she was the greatest support to me. Sometimes our suffering is not selfish, is not here, but it is for others, for us to comfort others. And I tell you, this lady, when she left, she was completely ready, and she felt that her suffering was there for a reason, and a very good reason, so that she can comfort her own son. So what are the reasons for suffering? Can you tell me? One. I sin. Two, they sin. Three, evil. Four, five, six, seven, glory to God or greater goodness. And eight, comfort others. If you have a theology of suffering, you understand why suffering, then the next question is, how do I react to suffering? And that would be the topic of our next, um, next discussion. I want to close with a very tiny small video just to show you how people suffer. And I will leave it up to you to see all these eight points 
all these eight points in this next video. Can you see it? It's up there? Is it up here? Yeah? Okay. Why do people suffer? All eight points. Try and, try and catch them in this. Did you catch some of these points? <laughs> okay. Now, to answer your question uh, very quickly, God, when he created this world, he put principles. And he abides by these principles. And that's his decision. So when he created this world, he created it under the principle of the laws of physics and the law of freedom, freedom of choice. So he cannot create man with freedom and then come and take it from him after. That's not God, because that'd be, uh, that would be self-contradicting, okay? So like a parent, when I say to my child, listen, if you finish your homework and I'm gonna treat you, once the person finishes their homework, I go and do what I said I will do. I put a law and I said I will abide to it. God put, put those two laws in the creation of the world physical, the, phys the, the laws of physics, and the freedom of choice. And for this, for, because of the freedom of choice, sin entered into the world, abnormality into the world, suffering, corruption, but even then, when we'll talk about how we suffer as Christians, you'll see things are not as bad as they seem. Does that answer your question? Do you want to use the mic so that other people can hear you? Um, just like, my question is that sometimes I feel like God intervenes when it comes to like certain situations, but other times he doesn't. Like, if your story's about people who are going to commit a murder and then they, um, they change their mind that second somebody comes to talk to them, you know, why does that happen sometimes and sometimes it doesn't? Right. So, um, we, we, sometimes it'd be very hard to to answer all and everything because we don't know everything but we know that God does so in my faith in God I know he knows all the aspects of whatever situation you're talking about and he knows the aspects of all the other ones as well so I trust that him intervening here is the right choice and him not intervening here is the right not just the right choice but the best choice okay if I were to answer that um, differently, I think I will presume that I know everything, which I don't, and I, I don't. Um, and that's why it's, it, we have to come to a point where we say, you know, when God says that, that His laws are far above ours and His understanding and His uh, statutes are far above ours, that that is true. But 
what governs the whole thing is the way he said this will be as such. Man will have free freedom of will, which I will never take away from him, even though I permit everything and I allow everything to happen. Nothing happens outside of God's allowance or permission, if you, if you will. And when we talk about how we we receive suffer, those who suffer, and how we react in suffering, I think this will become a little bit clearer. Because one of the things, I mean, there's so much to fit in one talk, but we assume, because we live in, in North America, we assume that we're supposed to live in pleasure. And um, suffering? No. Pain? Get a Tylenol. Um, which is really um, a tainted version of pain and pleasure in general. Um, just a quick thing, if when I asked you to put your, your arm or your, your uh, palm under your, your legs, if you didn't hurt and you didn't take, at one point, even if I would have asked you to keep it there, you wouldn't have. Why? Because feeling pain is a gift. Because if you didn't feel the pain, damage could have happened to your wrist. So, Maybe I'll get to touch on this in the, in the next few topics that we've been so socialized and, and brainwashed in North America to desire pleasure and run away from pain and suffering. Or there's time where you sh we shouldn't run away from pain and suffering. It is actually good to have pain and to have suffering.